I'm Jocelyn Kennedy. I'm the executive director of the Harvard Law School Library. Welcome to our book talk this afternoon. Thanks for being here. Copies of the book are outside the door um, if you'd like to buy a copy. And I think Professor Sunstein will be on hand to sign them afterwards. Uh, just so you know, today's talk is being recorded um, by the law school, including the question and answer period. So just want a heads up for you on that. And the recording should be available next week on the law school's YouTube channel. So it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Cass Sunstein, the Robert Walmsley University professor here at Harvard. In 2008, Professor Sunstein and behavioral economist Richard H. Thayer wrote a book called Nudge, Improving Decisions About Health, Wealth, and Happiness. As you may have heard, Professor Thayer was awarded the 2017 um, Economic Sciences Prize, uh, Nobel Prize, last week I think it was. Um, together, Professor Sunstein and Thayer, through their work exploring nudging, have influenced political entities both here and abroad, um, including government offices and others. Today, Professor Sunstein is going to talk to us about nudging government, so I'll turn it over to you. Okay, great. Okay, so thank you all for coming. Um, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about Thaler, shall I? This, in a way, is a tribute for uh, Dick Thaler. And uh, in the 1980s, late 70s, I think he started doing his work uh, late 70s and published 80s, uh, the world was full of rational choice theory as the kind of only theoretical foundation for thinking about behavior and law and policy. And there are a bunch of well-deserved Nobel Prizes that went there. Um, and the thought among those who didn't do or subscribe to rational choice theory at this law school, as well as in political science and sociology departments all over the world, I think is best described as clueless skepticism. And I was one of the clueless skeptics. A clueless in the sense that we thought, as we observed human behavior, including the, that of the people who propounded rational choice theory, that you know, they were complaining about their foolish investments, and they were having a hard time drinking less, and they maybe were in the midst of a difficult divorce. And if you watch them on the tennis court, they would hit ridiculous topspin backhands that flew over the, uh, you know, well out of the court when they should just hit a slice backhand. Is this too much jargon? <laughs> In other words, their, their uh, rationality was imperfect. Uh, and that was the source of the skepticism, just an observation. But the cluelessness was there wasn't really a theory to uh, domesticate or discipline the idea that people were uh, not fully rational. You needed an account of how they departed from rationality. It wouldn't be enough to say they aren't, or it wouldn't be enough to say that people are social animals. That doesn't create a testable hypothesis. So I think Thaler's great contribution to economic theory uh, with the help of Danny Kahneman and Amos Tversky, psychologists, was to have testable hypotheses about how people departed from uh, rational behavior, and then to be constructive in figuring out how to use that to make economics better and to make policy better. Uh, Thaler gave, I think, the wisest advice words um, in the history of advice words in the context of a graduation speech a few years ago in which he was describing when he got started on this, why he continued in the face of widespread responses from his advisors and uh, student colleagues that he was doing something hopeless and doomed, hopeless and doomed to embark on behavioral economics when there was no such thing. And he said he rejected their advice for two reasons. One was he wasn't very good at math. And so if he tried to do economics in a really good way, uh, he would have a built-in obstacle. But the second and more important was that he really loved it. And it, loving your work, he said, is the best hedge. So even if it had not gone well, he at least would have enjoyed the doing. OK, so in 2008, um, we wrote this book together with the elephants. And the reason for the confluence was while Thaler was uh, 
already uh, the leading light by far, I think, in terms of the development of the theory of behavioral economics. Uh, its use in policy was in its uh, early stages. And uh, our thought was there's an idea here uh, uh, stemming from his work and that of others, uh, which opens an assortment of tools for private and public sectors to use, uh, to which we, or at least I, had been oblivious. And the question was, how can we catalog this? One thing I think that's been lost in the 10 years since the book was done is that our aspiration, uh, uh, which is at, bo at best been, uh, what's the right word, an unmixed failure or a mixed failure, somewhere between. Our aspiration was to do something that would cut across left and right divides and uh, to produce a bunch of tools that would um, uh, be approved by both. And when I said unmixed failure, it's because the left doesn't like this stuff so much and the right doesn't either, at least in the United States. But I hesitated and described as mixed failure because while uh, the Obama administration has used a lot of nudging, so has the United Kingdom, which was at the time the stuff got going, headed by a conservative leader who saw this assortment of tools as fitting with uh, conservative thinking. Okay, so in terms of the UK, there's a book from 2010, a tremendous book by uh, David Halpern. Actually, the work started in 2010, the book is 2015. And uh, his um, uh, creativity, that is Halpern's, was to create what is called a nudge unit, an entity in the UK government that is self-consciously embarking on uh, tools uh, on, that preserve liberty, but that steer people in a direction that helps their lives go better. And they've had big successes. Uh, that's a photo from 2011. And President Obama was actually very um, directive with me. He's the president, so he gets to be, uh, saying that if, if there are ways to enlist these ideas that are minimally burdensome and maximally helpful, uh, uh, let's think about whether it makes sense to use them. So that I, a direction from the president actually has a uh, written form, which is Executive Order 13563, charmingly named. And the uh, direction there, and the president was personally um, very much uh, focused on this, is identify and consider approaches that reduce burdens and maintain flexibility and freedom of choice for the public. These approaches include warnings, appropriate default rules, and disclosure requirements, as well as provision of information to the public in a form that is clear and intelligible. You can think of that second sentence as calling out the uh, gold medalist of nudging, which is default rules, on which more in a moment, and the silver medalist of nudging, that is information and warnings. And the idea is both of these are uh, protecting freedom of choice and recognizing that if people want to go their own way, the default assumption should be they're entitled to in a free society, but also recognizing that there are approaches that uh, can be helpful. Okay, so here's Executive Order 13707, and both of these are very much on the books. Uh, this one, which you're getting a glance at, is actually a quite long executive order, and it essentially calls out behavioral science and directs the federal government to design policies and programs in a way that reflects uh, best understandings of how people actually are. So think of this as an executive order, it's very detailed, that says that we know a fair bit about how human beings behave. That is to say, we are not uh, clueless skeptics anymore. We are empiricists who are building understandings of how people react to stuff. And the federal government should take this on board. There is right now in the federal government, in the General Services Administration, an Office of Evaluation, which is uh, working every day on this kind of Okay, so because I have a new puppy and uh, my bank account is getting a little bit thin, uh, I thought I'd just notice there is a nudge treats for dogs. I actually have no economic stake in this, but I like to think every time someone buys these, it's kind of uh, uh, hedonic earnings. Okay, so, uh, so here's some uh, news from Germany. and. 
what I think is um, kind of uh, fantastically informative about this is both the finding in itself, and my hope is at least six people in the room, it's going to spur your creativity to go in some direction that no one ever, has ever gone before. So six, I'm hoping, is a lower bound. This is a study from Germany, a randomized controlled trial, recent with 41,000 households, so a big deal. Uh, Germany is a place where the population likes the idea of green energy and has long liked the idea of green energy, but the usage of green energy is very low. That's a puzzle. People like it, they don't do it. The randomized trial put uh, about half of the group, about 20,000 people, into an opt-in condition by which they were asked, do you want to enroll in green energy? It's a little more expensive, but it's environmentally preferred. The take-up rate was about 6.7%. Not nothing, statistically significant, but quite small. The best predictor of whether people would be in the opt-in group, or at least an excellent predictor, and I think the best they, they tested, was are people a member of the Green Party? That was an excellent predictor. Now, just hearing that, I think, I hope you're thinking, this study would have difficulty being published in one of the top journals. You find sl small take-up rate, not trivial, and the best predictor is whether they're green. Are you amazed by that finding? It's not that amazing, but it did get in one of the top journals, and the reason is that um, uh, the other 20,000 or so were in an opt-out design by which they were told, you're automatically in green energy, do you want to opt out? And under that design, the percentage of people who ended up in role was quite close to 70%. That's an astounding difference across a large population. And a test was done to see if the people who stayed in kind of knew what they were doing, and the answer is absolutely. It's not that they were inattentive. It's either that inertia was a force, so they thought they shouldn't opt out, or, or they didn't bother to take the trouble to opt out, or it's that the default rule had some uh, uh, informational signal in it, such that people thought, if the default is green, I'd probably be a creep if I go out of green. Okay, uh, that's, that's Germany. Um, we mentioned the behavioral insights team in the UK, which is going strong. The US had a White House social and behavioral sciences team. There's a new team in Germany whose work, as far as I'm aware, is uh, not public yet. There's activity in Canada, Mexico, Colombia, Italy, and many other nations. I think a conservative estimate is over 50 nations are now doing this stuff. And it's as if the work is at its, you know, at its early adolescence, but we're seeing an outpouring of material. Uh, what I want to put in bold letters here, it's institutionally important, I think important for law students, is that behavioral applications without dedicated offices in many nations are crushing nudge units in terms of their actual impact on policy. So I was on a phone call not long ago with high-level officials in a very famous nation, and the first thing they said to me, not the United States, the first thing they said to me was, with some sternness, please don't talk to us about nudge units. And I was a little puzzled, and then I said, I'm happy not to, how come? And they said, our ministries, our cabinet-level departments, we're all doing this. We don't want a nudge unit, we don't need a nudge unit. We have the work which is built into the DNA of our highest offices. And it was clear, as I learned from them, that the work they were doing was um, uh, central to their highest level policy making, and that's um, better than having an independent team which can have research and advisory functions. Though an independent team with research and advisory functions can be tremendous, and many nations right now are thinking about whether that's a good adjunct to what we're now doing. Okay, here's the World Bank's report from 2015, and what's noteworthy about the report is it's dedicated essentially entirely uh, to the topic of behavioral science and behavioral economics. And there's a passage early on which basically catalogs an assortment of problems which nations all over the world, particularly developing nations, but nations all over the world are facing. And it says that uh, uh, behavioral insights can't help. 
Okay, here's a, um, I don't know whether it's a poem or a, a haiku or a prayer. Uh, since I was at the University of Chicago for a long time, uh, it's, it's best characterized as a prayer. Uh, and it goes like this, human beings are rational. They calculate probabilities and maximize expected value. They respond to incentives. <coughs> Now, we wouldn't exactly pray to God with that, but it's a kind, it has a spiritual quality, doesn't it? You can describe it as a theology. And that idea is orienting for policy making all over the world. And the policy prescription that falls out is improve incentives. When I was at Harvard Law School a long time ago, the policy courses that had a world improvement flavor were all about basically this slide. That was the essence of it. And I believe that law schools and economics departments all over the world, still if you wanted to distill their ingredients uh, into one simple idea, this would be it. Okay, so relevant behavioral objections starting in the 1970s, and here Thaler was fundamental, uh, point to heuristics and biases. And I think it's important to say that some of the, um, let's say, less sweet responses to Thaler's Nobel in the last weeks, most of them are very sweet, but some of the less sweet have been saying that this is an elitist conception which stems from a belief that the authors or the bureaucrats are, um, what, immune from heuristics and biases to which other people are subject. Nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, Kahneman and Tversky's original work was built up by introspection about their own mistakes. And Thaler would be the first to say that uh, his awareness of his own biases and mental <coughs> shortcuts are fundamental to the development of his own work. I won't say much about Thaler on the tennis court, except A, he's pretty good, and B, he doesn't always follow the prayer in deciding what shot to hit. Okay, so uh, one point uh, which behavioral scientists have emphasized, especially in relatively recent times, is that human beings tend to be risk optimists. If you ask the average person uh, whether he is a better driver than the average person, there's roughly a 90% likelihood that he will say he is, and this cuts across men and women, which is to say that the vast majority of people believe that they are less likely to be in a serious accident than most people, and that can't be right. If you find a couple and ask them what is the percentage of the household work they do, and add up the two numbers, the percentage will be over 100% unless it's a very unusual couple. And I think this is causally connected in some way that uh, is not obvious, but I think there is a connection between this and the finding that if you ask people what is the, at the time of marriage, what's the likelihood that they would get divorced? They think it's 0%, even when they know the statistical probability is a lot higher than that. So there is a systematic tendency to uh, optimism which can produce problems with respect to health and finance. Okay, we know that uh, human beings suffer from present bias, which is that today is very salient. If you're gonna have a bad day today, uh, that's um, alarming. If you're gonna have a bad day a year from now, exactly, that's less alarming. And five years from now is a foreign country, later land, and who knows whether you're gonna visit. Optimistic bias and present bias are often a devastating combination. Okay, there's a work in behavioral science that was done a number of years ago that has to do with attention. And here, if you remember anything from the, these remarks, uh, I hope it's what I'm about to tell you, which is Daniel Kahneman, Thaler's predecessor in the uh, Nobel Prize awarding, did a book actually before he started doing the most fundamental work that led to behavioral science on the psychological side. It's a book called Attention and Effort. It's a fantastic title. It's not the most excitingly written book, but it's all organized around the idea of attention and effort. And the core idea is that to devote attention to anything is effortful, and we have 
not unlimited processing capacity in our own heads. And sometimes we will economize on effort self-consciously by saying, I'm not going to change the default rule. Or sometimes we will economize on effort unconsciously by not devoting, and without our awareness not devoting, attention to something. Now this is a, uh, a uh, photo from the Invisible Gorilla experiment, whose legal and policy uh, potential, I think, is, has yet to be exploited. As the experiment goes, you are in a room, and in that room there is a, a video in which players, just regular people, not LeBron James, are passing basketballs to one another, and your job is to count the number of passes. I was in this experiment, not in the early days, but at a time when uh, it was not that famous, and there were about 35 Harvard professors in the room, and we counted the passes. It was hard. After about 45 seconds, you kind of lost track, and, uh, but you tried. And then the experimenter said at the end of the pass counting exercise, uh, how many passes did you count? And we all said. And then he said, did you see the gorilla? And everyone except one laughed. There was no gorilla. And what kind of trick was being played? But one person raised his hand and said, yes, I saw the gorilla. And then the tape was replayed. And sure enough, there was a gorilla. 34 of 35 people in the room approximately missed the gorilla. Now among ordinary subjects rather than university professors, the percentage of people who miss the gorilla is usually a bit lower, but it's usually very, very high. I showed this to, I have a big daughter who's in her 20s, I told her what I told you and then showed the video, and after she saw it she said to me, where was the gorilla? which I thought was instructive. Even awareness of the presence of the gorilla doesn't necessarily produce visibility of the gorilla. Now, if you buy a product at the grocery store, or if you buy an automobile, or if you interact with a boss, uh, there are invisible gorillas everywhere in the fame, or if you date someone, there are invisible gorillas everywhere in the form of things that really matter, but that may not even appear on your view screen. Okay, there was a time in New York um, a few years ago when people were really scared of getting Ebola, so much so that going on the subways was to many alarming. That was at a time when more Americans had married Kardashians than had died of Ebola. <laughs> and people weren't saying, oh my God, I might marry a Kardashian. The reason for the excessive fear of Ebola was that the death that occurred from Ebola and the few illnesses in the United States were cognitively very available. And work that Thaler has turned into economics and that Kahneman and Tversky used in psychology suggests that our assessments of probability are often a product of whether an event is cognitively available. It's consistent with attention and effort. That can lead to excessive fear of Ebola and um, let's say uh, indifference or complacency with respect to real risks that are quite serious. Okay, last one I think is loss aversion. Uh, people dislike losses, they often hate losses, and they dislike losses more than they like equivalent gains. So if you're all told, I've got news for you, as a result of coming to this talk, you have to give $30 to Harvard, I'm detecting an upsurge of negativity in the room. <laughs> or if you're told instead, as a result of coming to this talk, you're getting $30 from Harvard, you're not loving that. <laughs> and that's consistent with the finding that a $30 loss is a lot more painful than a $30 gain is great. And that has implications for policy. Because whether something is framed as a loss or gain or introduced as a loss or gain can matter greatly to impact. Tiny example, uh, a small uh, bonus for bringing your own uh, bag to a convenience store has, as a first approximation, no effect on paper bag usage. By contrast, a very small charge for using a bag, buying a bag in Washington, D.C., has a very sizable impact on usage. That's partly that because a very small charge is painful 
and a very small gain is basically trivia. Okay, so here are five or six behavioral policy claims from the 2000s continuing uh, today. They started basically in the 2000s. The first is default rules really matter and they're everywhere. The second is incentives may not matter much, contrary to the poem. So the idea of introducing an incentive as a way of changing behavior, be careful with that. It might not have the expected impact. Choice arch architecture is exceedingly important. And the idea here is that in any situation in which one finds oneself at a point of decision, there's an architecture behind the choice. If you go to the grocery store, there's an architecture there. It may be designed by people who are aware of behavioral science. It may be a result of randomness. It might be based on intuitions. But the architecture importantly determines what people will do. And it could often be different from what it is. Choice architecture might seem like a somewhat alarming Orwellian idea. But notice, if you would, that it's not avoidable. To have a grocery store or website or a rental car agreement that doesn't have an architecture in it, you just can't do that. It will have one and it will affect behavior. Here's a little choice architecture finding. There's data suggesting that if people sign a document at the beginning rather than at the end, they're less likely to be untruthful. That truthfulness increases if they are on the line at the beginning. Now, the explanation for that, I don't think we fully understand. It may have something to do with attention and effort, but it provides an opportunity, and there's going to have to be a place where people sign a form. Okay, people can use a nudge, a little more on that in a moment, and simplicity is very important. Uh, Thaler has recently introduced a new word, sludge, where the notion is that private and public institutions impose sludge all the time, sometimes for good reasons, sometimes not, and sludge has a big impact on outcomes. The American people are subject to over 9 billion annual hours in paperwork. Much of that is sludge. Okay, so uh, what is a nudge? There's a little elephant who's being nudged. A GPS can be thought of as a canonical nudge, and what makes it uh, a useful kind of defining example, is that it's fully respectful of people's own freedom of choice, but it steers them in the direction that they want to go. Now, in the easy cases, there is an antecedent place that people want to go. It might be health, it might be prosperity, it might be a job, but they don't have the equivalent of a GPS. And what private and public institutions often do that is super public spirited and has a massive impact is provide the functional equivalent of a GPS. It gives you a signal of what direction you should go if you want to get to the destination that you like. OK, uh, this is the only scandalous slide. It's a urinal. Probably some of the women in the room have never seen a urinal. That's actually what it looks like. But this, lovely, yes? <laughs> No wonder men smile when they enter. They might see that. But this isn't just a regular urinal. This is a urinal from the Netherlands airport. And there's a fly painted on the urinal. That's not a real fly. The impact of the fly painting on the urinal was to introduce spillage, was to reduce spillage at the Netherlands airport by over 40%. I don't know or want to know who figured that out and how, <laughs> but that's the evident data. Apparently, men can't help but aim at the fly. <laughs> now, what makes this an instructive example is that in many domains in which people get themselves into trouble, large or small, they don't have a painted fly. And credit card bills now, which often say something about late fee or overuse fee in very bold letters, they're doing the equivalent of painting the, the fly on the bill. And the idea of attention and effort is central here. We won't go into more details about the specifics of this empirical success story, but let's just say it has something to do with attention and effort. This is a postcard I was actually sent by a friend from Germany. Uh, I don't speak German, but this nudge apparently went wrong. 
Okay, uh, we have in the room uh, one of the world's greatest experts on this uh, from our Treasury Department. Uh, and this is just a little data from Vanguard, uh, which has, I think, quite stunning numbers, both with respect to retirement generally and with respect to uh, policy interventions that no one's thought of yet, that I'm hoping some people in the room will uh, arrive at. Okay, this is showing that at every end of the income distribution, automatic enrollment in a retirement plan is significantly increasing participation rates. And it's showing also informatively that the extent of the increase is at the uh, greatest at the lowest end of the income distribution. So notice what we're doing here as a policy is not using taxpayer money to encourage savings. That's not the intervention. It's that people are automatically enrolled in a savings program once they come into the relevant company. And the evidence is that at the low end of income distribution, the opt-out rate is pretty small, 22%. And the opt-in rate was quite small, 34%, when you had that design. So the basic idea, as in the German Green Energy Plan, is you can massively increase usage rates just by switching the default. Okay, I'll give a little example that it's gonna involve a policy which isn't gonna make the blood go, but my uh, belief is that the impact on people's lives could be massive. In the United States, our most successful anti-poverty program, and we're not talking just about poor people, but disproportionately people of color and disproportionately women, is the Earned Income Tax Credit. And the earned income tax credit basically gives a little boost, economic boost, for people who uh, aren't earning a whole lot but are in the workforce. And I think it was originally a Republican idea. As such, the earned income tax credit doesn't divide people sharply along ideological lines, though some people like it more than others. It's basically a fantastic anti-poverty program. A number of people in America, a very large number of people, aren't benefiting from the earned income tax credit. But the US government has the information about who is eligible for the earned income tax credit. There are administrative, political, and other challenges in making the earned income tax credit automatic, but it's worth investigating doing exactly that to consider whether the challenges can be overcome. I'm phrasing this cautiously, but a suggestion is automaticity for the earned income tax credit could make uh, very large numbers of human lives for working Americans much better. Okay, so we're talking about features of the social environment that affect choices without imposing coercion or material incentives. Disclosure of information, warnings, default rules, reminders and drawing people's attention to social norms, those are examples. Jail sentences, subsidies, tax incentives, uh, those aren't examples of nudges. Okay, in the US, and these are among the initiatives by and large that the current administration has not been focused on eliminating. That is, the current administration has been focused on uh, high cost, big ticket items that seem to it too aggressively regulatory. But if we look at the credit card law from a few years ago, which basically has disclosure requirements and nudges and quasi-nudges, meaning things that are quite like nudges, its effect is to save American consumers over $10 billion a year annually. And I confess I was in the government at the time, I did not expect that magnitude of impact. Uh, our Consumer Bureau has as a motto, know before you owe, which is a simple idea of ensuring that consumers don't get themselves into economic difficulty by inadvertently piling up bills. So no before you owe is a engine for maybe mortgage and credit card and loan reform uh, generally. For healthcare, there are disclosure requirements, and maybe we haven't exploited this uh, sufficiently yet, that can both um, get people in the system automatically, and Republicans have shown keen interest in that, that can enlist disclosure both with respect to health at the individual level and with respect to plan content that can produce better health plans for people. There's new data suggesting that people all over America are choosing plans that don't uh, serve their situations 
which results in economic harm and maybe not the right health care they should be getting. And that's a result of uh, some combination of sludge and inadequate nudging. Okay, here's, uh, I confess, of all the nudges that any government has adopted, this is the one that is most meaningful to me, and I, I got to participate in it a bit. Uh, it's a program that is uh, designed to make sure that poor children in the United States um, are uh, getting free breakfasts and lunches that are nutritionally decent. So that's the program. Poor kids get to eat. Uh, for a long time, the enrollment rate has been, as for the earned income tax credit, but worse, well below the desired level. So kids all over our country who are eligible for meals under a program that Congress created aren't getting the meals because their parents don't sign them up. Now, why exactly parents haven't signed them up is a bit of a mystery. We can speculate. Uh, it might be that if you're poor and you get a letter from the government, that's a little frightening. And given the attention effort uh, trade-off, you just don't pay attention to it. It might be that you're really busy and therefore you're not going to attend to something that seems like sludge. It might be that once you open up, it's confusing and detailed, and so you throw it out. Um, we can have other speculations. The program created by Congress is called Direct Certification, which basically says uh, school districts and localities, if they know the kids are eligible, they can sign them up automatically. They're in. Now, relatively recent data, and the number's up now, suggested that uh, upwards of 12 million, I think it's over 13 million American kids, are now enrolled in programs as a result. And while that's a number, if there were you know, some very small percentage of those children uh, walking outside of this building or doing a kind of uh, you know, statement of participation uh, here, uh, there pro probably wouldn't be a dry eye in this house, yes? Okay, um, Oregon and many other states now are either adopting or considering, uh, considering automatic voter registration. And I have the data showing that Americans are majority approvers of automatic voting registration. The idea is instead of having sludge before you're a voter, if you are a citizen of the state, and that's known, and if you're of uh, voting age, and that's known, you're automatically registered to vote. You can choose not to vote if you don't want, and as Oregon says, you can choose not to be a registered voter if you want. But the presumption is you are a voter. That's the default rule. In Germany, many companies aware of the data just given uh, have actually adopted green defaults. For printers, if you want to save money at an inst institution, this is small but not meaningless, adopt a double-sided uh, printing option for your computer. And the Affordable Care Act has some uh, movement in the direction of automatic enrollment. It hasn't gone very far. Maybe in the next few years we'll see much more. Okay, here's a slogan I had in the US government. I had a big picture of something you're about to see, and the words over it were plate, not pyramid. And uh, I hope this will be intelligible. This is the most visited, I believe, US government website for a number of years. It's the food pyramid. It's a nudge. And you see a person, gender unclear, can't tell if that's a man or a woman, can you? Walking to the top of a pyramid. Imagine you're a student, a teacher, um, a nutritionist, or a parent trying to figure out what your kid or what you should eat. Uh, do you know what that white triangle at the top is? Where the person is, is marching, the shoeless person is marching? It's, is that thinness? Is, is it death? Is, is, it, is it heaven? <laughs> it's unclear, isn't it? Then you see these bands, green, blue, red, orange. Do you know what those bands are signifying in terms of relevant food groups? I don't, and I study this stuff. Do you recognize any of the foods there? Are any of them recognizable? The only one that I think is unambiguously clear is bottom right. Can you see on the bottom right? That's a shoe, isn't it? <laughs> 
Isn't the US, is the US government saying, eat your shoe? OK, so uh, what we did was to get rid of the pyramid and to replace it with the food plate. And the food plate basically says, make half your plate fruits and vegetables, and you're most of the way home. And whether or not this is perfect, it is a very simple nudge that's being used by private and public institutions now all over the world. What matters is less the perfection of the food plate than the slogan, plate not pyramid. And I'll give you a little tale that a friend of mine in the US government a few years ago was in a very complicated negotiation with another country. And it mattered because the President of the United States was going there, and we hoped and expected that there would be a deliverable, ugly word, government word, a deliverable, such that the President's trip would have value. But two days before the President was to arrive, there was no agreement on anything. It was doomed. And my friend was deputized to go over to conduct a negotiation to see if there was something. And um, I talked to my friend that after the first day and said, how's it going? And the answer was fantastic. And I said, how did that happen? And the words exploded into my cell phone, plate, not pyramid. And I had no idea what this person was talking about and said, what do you mean? And the answer was, look, we had a, a lack of clarity in what we wanted the other country to do. So they basically said no to everything. Once I came over, I listed eight things that we hoped we could have agreement on, and they said yes to five of them. So the idea was that sometimes a failure to assent to something is less a product of resistance than incomprehension. And the path forward is to transform a plate into a pyramid, and then you get agreement on some things at least, or at least you get specificity on what you don't agree on. I can say that uh, quite recently I was in another part of the United States which is adopting a, uh, a form simplification project uh, of a very ambitious sort. And what the architects, the choice architects of the form simplification project are emphatic on is that their government is providing a series of benefits to people which uh, take the form of pyramid applications, meaning it looks like this. So people don't know what they're supposed to do. What they're trying to do is scale back the uh, forms with the thought that that's no mere time saver. It also will have massive effects in getting people to have job training, permits, driver's licenses, other things that really matter to them. OK, here's some data on whether nudges work. Um, I think the most spectacular finding in all of behavioral economics, building on Thaler's uh, insights, uh, comes from Denmark, which finds that automatic enrollment in savings plans has a much bigger impact, impact than significant tax incentives. Now, the area of retirement is a little dry, but the finding is anything but that. The notion that significant tax incentives have a very modest effect on savings, but automatic enrollment, which is essentially costless, has a big impact. That's like a Grimm's fairy tale for behavioral science and its future usage, meaning it's a story that has uh, implications. The Credit Card Act, as noted, is saving billions of dollars annually, much of it through nudges. And many of the savings are concentrated among people with poor credit ratings. They're the ones who need the help, and evidently, they're getting it. There's a company in um, the United States, it's been called until relatively recently, Opower, which sends people a home energy report. It's very simple, telling them how their energy use compares with that of their peers. A little simple note, saying whether you're using more energy than your peers. And that has a bigger effect than significant price increases in reducing energy usage. In the UK, they've taken advantage of this kind of finding by trying to get doctors to prescribe antibiotics less. That's important for public health. And the tool they chose was to tell the biggest prescribers, uh, you are in the group of the biggest prescribers. Over a six-month period, that reduced prescriptions by over 65,000. 
just by drawing attention to their uh, unusualness. Okay, simplification of the financial aid form, which really matters for people who don't have a lot of money going to college, uh, has the same effect in increasing college admissions as a several thousand dollar increase in the subsidy. Now the big lesson of these examples is we're talking about behaviorally informed tools that are having equivalent or larger effects on uh, outcomes than that of more expensive, often much more expensive tools. Armed by this, a team, which I was privileged to be involved, Thaler too, uh, we tried a very risky empirical study meaning it might be devastating to some of our favorite ideas, which was to compare wherever we could the cost effectiveness of the nudge intervention with other interventions. And we did a, a, a fairly substantial class of interventions. And it may be an artifact of those for which data, data is available, but to at least my personal surprise, the nudge intervention had kind of crushingly better uh, cost effectiveness than the alternative intervention. In a way, along one dimension, that should not be stunning. They're usually inexpensive, so they should have cost effectiveness. What was to me a surprise was their um, frequent uh, uh, effectiveness on the benefit side was higher. Okay, I think I'll just note a complaint about the potentially tyrannical quality of nudging and a response that A, nudging is inevitable. Recall the uh, omnipresence of choice architecture, even if you don't want it. And uh, Thaler's findings about human error. So if people are present biased and unrealistically optimistic, if they don't see gorillas and if they have challenges dealing with probability, then freedom preserving interventions probably aren't going to be tyrannical. From the left, it is often urged that coercion or economic incentives are better and that nudges are kind of tinkering at the margin. In some cases, that might be true. But notice, if you would, that if choice architects have their own agendas, if government or businesses don't know everything, which is frequently, maybe always the case, and if one size doesn't fit all because there's a lot of heterogeneity out there, we should see freedom of choice as pretty important safeguard. Okay, I think I will end uh, with a note on a frontiers issue, which uh, uh, Eldar Shafir and Sendal Mullenathan of Harvard have drawn attention to, which goes back to the idea of attention and effort. And as I say, this is something where I think the next generation is gonna make a ton of progress. What they urge is that if you are poor, or if you are lonely, or if you are busy, or if you are uh, in love, there is something that is um, uh, common, which is that the attention and effort problem is magnified. So if you're hungry, then you're focused on food and your capacity to about think about other things is really limited. If you're lonely, then you're thinking about how to get friends which isn't actually the most productive thing to think about when you're trying to get friends, <laughs> kind of self-defeating. Uh, and if you're poor, the focus you will frequently have is how am I going to make ends meet? Now the claim here is that there, there is a cognitive limitation born of scarcity. And the data that I think most vividly demonstrates this is if you ask poor people to take an IQ test at a mall tomorrow, they're gonna do about as well as rich people. If you ask them to solve an arithmetic problem and then take an RQ test, they're gonna do as well as rich people. If you ask rich people and poor people both to solve a financial problem first about how are they gonna come up with a couple thousand dollars if their car is broken down, and then they take the IQ test, poor people's IQ falls by eight or nine points, which is about the amount of IQ loss that you would suffer if you got no sleep last night and that suggests that the state of poverty frequently puts people who have to struggle with finances into a, a, a very challenging position where their bandwidth is limited, which is to suggest that handling the problem of poverty by asking poor people to do more stuff and fill out more forms and train more is often uh, counterproductive. 
Okay, so what we've learned is to identify behavioral market failures. Uh, each of the behavioral biases can be described as a behavioral market failure to expand the catalog of policy tools. And we're starting to get to a place where we can patch, match the fire to the tool. So the greatest, I think, English language poet of the 20th century, William Butler Yeats, with apologies to Harvard's T.S. Eliot, maybe the second greatest, had something to say, which is do not wait to strike until the iron is hot but make it hot by striking. Now that's a nudge. Thanks. We have a few minutes for questions. If you'll raise your hand, I can pass the mic. Uh, this seems like an instance where the states as laboratories of democracy might actually be very helpful. So I wonder if you could tell us about any sort of state level initiatives in nudges. I think even this week, there's a bill before the Massachusetts legislature which would create a behavioral unit in Massachusetts state government. Um, I know that all over the country, either ideas of this kind are being used informally or there are formal people charged with doing this. Uh, we're at early stages, but in, you know, in California, New York, and Ohio, and uh, Illinois, there's activity. Um, so you're right that because there's so much to learn about what works and what doesn't, this is a real laboratories of democracy thing, and, and it's happening. Uh, thank you, Professor Sunstein, for your presentation. So from what I was able to understand, I may be wrong, uh, nudging emerges from the shortcomings of rational choice theory and the blind spots in evaluating how rational or rational human beings may be. Um, to what extent can nudging also be understood, at least partially, as uh, a public sector response to the extent to which private actors are able to manipulate choice as well, which raises concerns this thing from rationality? OK, that's, that's great. So I can say that just uh, Thaler and I were focused on uh, bounded rationality and responding to it. But there is current interest in responding to private sector nudging of a sort that isn't in people's interests. And the uh, kind of the theme book for this is by two Nobel Prize winners, Akerlof and Schiller, and it's called Fishing for Fools, P-H-I-S-H and P-H-O-O-L-S. And it combines the two themes. The idea is that exploitation of cognitive biases is something that companies are quite good at. And uh, I, th I think some companies have been explicit about this, though they wouldn't phrase it quite that way. And uh, P-H-O-O-L-S, you could understand that as um, you know, homo sapiens, not meaning that we're fools, but meaning that we are uh, potentially um, exploitable by private sector biases. Now, uh, I think the former, one of the top people at the Federal Trade Commission uh, a few years ago said, we are very alert to the exploitation of cognitive biases, and that's something we're thinking about. So the FTC has been on this. Th this what makes this so exciting, I confess, is that on all of these areas, uh, just speaking for myself, I, I feel like our book and our works, my work since has been seeing through a glass darkly, meaning just a, a glimpse of the potential work to be done. And uh, on the front you describe, uh, just gotten started. Now it should, you know, in my view, be consistent with respect for free market economy, and sellers get to do a lot of stuff without violating the Federal Trade Commission's animating statutes. But to think about it both as an ethical issue and as something where maybe there's a policy response, that's really important, especially for things like uh, cigarettes and distracted driving where the uh, safety and health consequences are not small. So a related question. Um, at the end, you mentioned um, that the people making the choices or the choice architecture might have agendas on their own. And I'm thinking more um, not in the private sector, 
um, but government actors themselves. And you said that the freedom of choice would be a safeguard. Um, but tying that to what you said at the very end about um, cognitive load issues, can we really trust freedom of choice to be a good safeguard if people are so burdened um, with everything else going on that they often won't uh, act in a way that is really what they want to be doing? It's a great point. So uh, freedom of choice is an important safeguard, but for the very reasons that uh, nudging is sometimes helpful, freedom of choice might be an insufficient safeguard. So if the government automatically enrolled all of us in a certain political party or religion, uh, the percentage of opt-outs would be a lot lower than the percentage of people who aren't that excited about that political party or religion, which supports your point. So freedom of choice suggests that if we're focused on government overreaching, mandates and bans should probably be our, our central focus but nudges would not be immune from uh, concern. And that suggests that freedom of choice should be supplemented by something like uh, transparency, accountability, um, maybe a public comment process typically, where people subject to the nudge get to see it and comment on it. Uh, notably, I've now worked with a European co-author on uh, people's attitudes toward nudges in the now we have a bunch of countries. And it, there's almost a global consensus on when nudging is OK. And the principles are pretty tight. It's uh, if the nudge is in the interests of the nudgees, and if they are uh, legitimately motivated, then people are going to be for them. If they detect an illicit motive, like in the religion or uh, political party case, or if they think that it's not in the interest of the people being nudged, then their hackles grow up. And that's almost the whole thing. And that is, I think, a first cut into, into your concern. So we need something that hasn't been developed, I think, which is a, uh, almost like a restatement of the law of nudging, which would have constraints on governments doing that. Um, Professor Sunstein, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I was wondering, uh, when you're trying to implement uh, like a way of thinking uh, in the government like about nudges that you should uh, try to implement nudges in policy making, um, and uh, you have a country that is not currently doing that, what is the best way to, for example, um, try to help pe people eat healthier? Like, mm, how, what is the best way to do that? Should, you, should it be through legislation, like the way that it is in Massachusetts right now? Or should it be through, for example, seeing a, like a community-based initiative that is using nudging that is successful in helping people may eat healthier, for example, and then the government sees that this is working and trying to implement that in the government? It's a, a great question. I, I don't know that there's an abstract answer. Uh, the, so you could build from best private sector practices, or you could build a public sector practice which is original. And uh, the advantage of the best private sector practices, is, is, if it exists, is you'll have an evidence base. So the risk of blunder is reduced. Uh, it may be that there's sufficient data that the public sector can do something for which there isn't a private sector analog. So the food plate, which seems to be good, to my awareness, there wasn't a private sector analog. And if you buy a car anywhere in the United States now, there's a fuel economy label, which is basically a bunch of nudges. It tells you the most important, I think, environmentalists would not agree, and I am an environmentalist, but along this dimension, I'm not with them. The most important is it tells you annual fuel cost. So you can see how much it's going to cost. Now, also significant, there's some environmental information. And those don't have a private analog. But if you have private sector behavior that is informing you um, and it works, then there's reason at least to consider it. Now, the evidence base on one view for the government doing something sh should, ha should have to be excellent because it's the government and it shouldn't be just guessing. And the private sector guessing is less dangerous, maybe, and consumers can go elsewhere. Um, so I wouldn't give an abstract answer, but uh, 
the, the need for evidence is insistent, and in the areas discussed so far, we actually have it, but we need to have more. So what I hope some, some, some of you are thinking is, you know, this isn't, ab some of this talk is abstract, but this isn't abstract stuff. Over 40,000 Americans died on the highways in 2016, and that's a statistic, but each one of those is a tragedy. Over 400,000 Americans died in smoking. The opioid crisis is out of control, and, uh, you know, the problem of persistent poverty is, is, is real. Uh, whatever view you have of immigration, whether you're with President Trump or not, there's, I think, an overlap of concerns that have a behavioral component to it, and we could address all of them, all of these things, uh, through choice-preserving approaches. We could make a dent, and the question is, what are we going to do? Thank you. Can you take one? Thing? Sure. Okay. Thanks. Um, I'm a student in the design school, and a lot of these sound like really interesting sort of design challenges. And I'm curious if you have any other examples besides the urinal and the and the plate that sort of design that maybe designers were brought into part of the the fix or oh. any areas that you think are particularly ripe for designers to to play a role okay i'm so glad you asked that and that you came because design was actually an inspiration for our book and don norman who's focused on design was in a way our uh our non-social science or non-economics psychology guru um uh, website design, I'm not sure this is what you're thinking about, but website design is a key example. And there's a brilliant book, Website Design, by a designer who, so far as I know, knows nothing about this stuff, but it is a great title which bears on building design. It says, don't, don't make me think. That's the title of the book. And the idea is that a well-functioning website, it economizes on effort. So his book really is about attention and effort. And the thought is whether the focus of building is to create a well-functioning workplace or to be environmentally better, uh, not to make people think before something good happens so that they just do it unless they don't want to, that uh, is a way in. So a simpler way to put it is one of Thaler's, I think Thaler's number one rule for nudging is make it easy. And uh, building design can completely have that feature. So if you, I was at one of the big Silicon Valley companies not long ago, and if you look at just the layout, the interaction is so easy. Everyone's there together. They don't have separate cubicles. And I know of a law school which is famous for people are interacting all the time, where just the building is designed so that it's, it's hard not to interact. Their offices, they're all going to see each other. And so that's, uh, there's so much more to do on the design, I think, that you're probably focused on that is attentive to some of these principles. Yeah. All right, we're, our time is up. I, we could, you have such wonderful questions today, we could go all afternoon. But I'd like to thank Professor thank Sunstein again on behalf of the library. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thanks. Thanks for coming.